Today we have an exciting launch as we welcome three illustrious women to discuss the Neuro Arts Blueprint. This initiative will advance the science of arts, health, and well-being in the broadest sense, from how we experience architecture to music and everything in between. Joining us is Susan Magnus-Salmon, founder and director of the International Arts and Mind Lab at the Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is the author of The Impact Thinking Model, an evidence-based research approach to accelerate how we use the arts to solve problems in health, well-being, and learning. And she is a fellow at the Royal Society of the Arts and strategic advisor to a whole range of leading organizations in this field. Also joining us today is Ruth Katz, Vice President and Executive Director of the Health, Medicine, and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. Prior to her work there, she served as Chief Public Health Counsel with the Energy and Commerce Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, Dean of the School of Public Health at George Washington University, and Associate Dean at the Yale School of Medicine. And from the NIH, we have Dr. Emmeline Edwards, Director of Extramural Research for the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Prior to joining NIH, Dr. Edwards was Associate Professor of Pharmacology and Neuroscience at the University of Maryland, where she developed a genetic model of depression. And she chairs World Women in Neuroscience in the International Mentoring and Networking Group. Emmeline and I are working with the Kennedy Center to provide a platform for science with Sound Health. She's co-chair of the NIH Music and Health Working Group. So full disclosure, I'm fortunate to be one of four co-chairs on the advisory board for NeuroArts, along with neuroscientist Eric Nessler, Michael Passernak, president of Lionsgate Motion Picture Productions, and actress and playwright Anna DeBeer Smith. So I'm equally delighted to be sharing news of this initiative with you. Before we begin, a reminder to submit questions in the comments section on my Facebook page. Music and Mind Live has over 540,000 views from 67 countries. Thank you and keep sharing. Welcome Susan, Ruth, and Emmeline. Susan, you brought this idea to us individually. Please tell us what neuroaesthetics is. I hadn't heard of this discipline when I met you. And what is the International Arts and Mind Lab? So neuroaesthetics is a mouthful, right? It's just a big word. Um, but when you really think about it, um, neuroaesthetics at its basic form is how our brain and bodies change on arts and aesthetic experience. And that's something that the artists have known since the beginning of time. We've intuitively felt the way that things have changed. Um, there's a neuroanatomist named Jill Bolt Taylor who says, we believe that we are thinking creatures that feel, but we are actually feeling creatures that think. And I, I think that's really at the essence of neuroaesthetics. Um, at the late 1990s, um, Samir Zeki, who is at the University College of London, coined this term neuroaesthetics. And it really was to, to really begin to think more deeply about the science of the underpinnings of aesthetic experience. So aesthetic experiences we know are things that bring sensor, that our sensory systems bring into our bodies. So it makes sense that the arts would be some of the most pri primal aesthetic experiences. Um, initially, Dr. Zeki's work looked at the neurobiology of beauty and he was looking um, using fMRI and other kinds of um, biomarkers to be able to better understand that. Over the years, um, many researchers, neuroscientists, cognitive researchers, 
um, social workers, uh, uh, public health folks have begun to think about the role of the arts and how arts can really help in health and well-being. So today we find ourselves at the nexus of this emerging field of what we're now calling neuroarts, which is really a shorthand for neuroaesthetics, to really think more deeply about how we can use these art modalities to be able to help physical health, mental health, thinking about both as an intervention, but also as a prevention. So the International Arts and Mind Lab is something that you founded? It is, um, but I will give total credit to our donor of the Brain Science Institute, who very early days, 19, uh, well, I guess late, late 1990s, early 2000s, said she believed that the arts had the ability to heal us and that she really wanted to make an investment in how we could begin to study that in a robust and rigorous way. So in 2008, we had an event called the Science of the Arts, where we brought together researchers and artists and really began to explore how the arts and science could come together. And we found that there was such great overlap in that. Um, so that was really where we began. And, and um, through the Hopkins leadership, we were able to uh, step back and look at what was happening around the world in this emerging field of neuroaesthetics. What we found was that there were many labs around the world, many organizations, healthcare institutions, cultural organizations, and community organizations using the arts to serve health and well being. They hadn't helped together. So, over the last five years, we've been working at developing research models to study the arts and the arts and really understanding the problems that we find solve all the way through the arts dissemination. Also, been trying to convene the bring these arts together, and that's where the new arts came from. And then, last, um, if we understand the science, the science, how do we train practitioners and researchers to be able to this study and apply this to the most important intersection? Great. Now, Ruth, when did you first speak with Susan about the Aspen Institute's involvement? So I'm interested in, in how neuroarts came about, this idea that neuroaesthetics would be a best, the basis for creating this integrated strategy for health and wellness. Um, and tell us what the Aspen Institute is. So give us a little bit of background for the audience and then how you got involved. Sure, I will do that. But, but Renee, before I jump into all that, let me first thank you for inviting us to be part of today's program. Full engagement. Neuro Arts Blueprint Project, including this opportunity to officially launch the initiative. We really appreciate all of that. Um, about the Aspen Institute, for those of you in the audience who are not familiar, I know Renee, you are. The Aspen Institute is a global nonprofit organization committed really to a free, just, and equitable society. It's been around for over 70 years now. We celebrated our 70th birthday last year with the purpose of driving change through dialogue, leadership, and action really try and solve some of the biggest challenges facing the United States and indeed the entire world. And we do that through a number of mechanisms, um, including policy programs such as the Health Medicine and Society Program, which I direct, through conferences and events such as the Aspen Ideas Festival, which I expect a number of your people in the audience are familiar with, uh, with leadership programs and seminars as well. Um, the bottom line, uh, the Aspen Institute is all about working with Earth background, different points of view, and develop ideas on how to address these really difficult, challenging issues. Ideas into action have a really positive impact on individuals and society. And with that, about that, who we are, uh, through a mutual professional colleague, Susan and I came together for what I think has turned out to be a pretty perfect match. And the Institute was created some 70 years ago of the most important pillars behind the um, establishment of the Institute was a commitment to science and a commitment to the arts. So when Susan came to my office and said, we have an idea, how do we make it happen? And began to talk about neuro arts, turning it into a field that would be recognized um, uh, really uh, around the world, because we're talking about an international program here. Uh, I jumped at the opportunity, as did the leadership of the Aspen Institute. So we're delighted to be working with Susan and her team. She and her focusing the science. We bring the convening power. 
of bringing the best and the brightest together. And together, we think we're gonna really move this field very far along and we're excited to be able to do so. Well, I'm thrilled. I've always admired uh, the Aspen Institute because I've spent a lot of time in Aspen and know how exciting it is. Uh, Emmeline, I have to say, I was delighted to discover the National Institutes of Health even has a division for the research of complementary and integrative health. NeuroArt seeks to address problems of chronic and degenerative disease, mental health challenges, trauma, and addiction to the, these addictions that plague us. So what inspired you to follow this path of integrative medicine? Essentially, you know, I uh, have been at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health for the past 10 years. And um, it's been really a, a great journey for me because I realized the, the, the impact of uh, thinking about integrative health as a way to combine complementary approaches with conventional approaches. And really the focus is on patient-centered approach. It's really a holistic approach to uh, you know, treat the individual on multiple domain. And the idea is that we should treat the whole person, not a single organ. So when Susan actually uh, talked to me about uh, this idea of neuro arts, I was already involved with some health already, which is this partnership that you mentioned earlier about the, the NIH, the Kennedy Center, and the National Endowment of the Arts, that's really trying to study the impact of music on, on health. So neuro arts was appealing to me because it's actually a, a broader uh, spectrum of uh, art forms. So it, it's a perfect marriage, uh, the uh, concept of integrative health and actually looking at the potential of the arts as a uh, complementary approach in a way, a mind and body approach. Uh, to impact health. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, as a singer and as an artist myself, I always found that if my mind and body weren't aligned, nothing was going to work properly. So there was, we, because it's all involuntary, we fully understand the power of this. And it's that science will eventually support it and prove it is, is actually music to our ears. So we're going to, without further, further ado, we're going to show a video to introduce the neuro arts blueprint. Here we go. This is your brain and body on art. Creating art and experiencing art is uniquely human. An essential part of our evolution. But did you know the arts are a powerful tool for improving health and well-being? The interdisciplinary field of neuroarts, where science, technology, the arts, and health converge is discovering how the arts change our biology and behavior and can be used to improve mobility, memory, speech, relieve pain in the after effects of trauma and PTSD, enhance physical and mental health. We now have compelling evidence that music aids patients with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Dance eases the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Visual arts help people recover from depression, stress, and anxiety. By harnessing these powerful biological forces, the arts can treat disease, prevent illness, improve quality of life, and strengthen community. Learn more about the extraordinary promise of the arts to address some of our greatest health challenges. Neuro Arts Blueprint. I love that the video contains moments we recognize from the pandemic and, and programs we've already highlighted on Music and Mind Live, such as Creative Forces and Dance for Parkinson's. Susan and Ruth, please walk us through the Neuro Arts Blueprint. I, I find it really ambitious, but translating research into programs and policies that connect medicine and community is what inspires me to advocate for science. Maybe I'll start and, and um, I'll turn it over. I'll jump in. Okay, great. So, you know, this does sound like a very ambitious program, um, but it really is an ambitious program that needs to happen. And we're looking about at this over the next five to 10 years. So we know so much about the science of sensory systems. We know a lot about cognition. We know a lot about reward systems, default mode network. We know quite a bit about how these basic mechanisms work. We also are beginning to know how to translate those into practice. So the neuro arts blueprint really is looking at 
understanding and quantifying what we know about how the brain and body changes on the arts and how that can be translated into practice. We have thousands, if not millions of artists all over the world that are using arts in health and well-being. And the goal of the blueprint is to be able to help those practitioners increase the, their knowledge about how the brain and body changes as they implement and use their practice. And we know that there are policies all over the world that are also beginning to think about complementary and integrative health. So what can those policies um, do to help in advance that work at work, at school, at healthcare institutions, in communities, and also in cultural arts organizations? And then finally, there's a financial resources issue. Um, if we have a plan that really uses the science to expand this work, where does the funding come from? And we believe that public and private partnerships and funding are going to be very important. And then communicating both at the grassroots level and the institutional level. So the blueprint sort of will lay out how this plan will come to life. In order to do that, we have been collecting knowledge from a wide range of organizations and individuals over the last year. And that has included um, bringing together stakeholders from many disciplines. So we most recently brought together researchers, practitioners, and policymakers to talk about how they see this field. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What are some of the big ideas in how to really bring this field forward? We also are doing a field overview that looks at the last 15 years of the field. Um, as you know, technology has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. And so the ability to use technology for intervention, for research, and for, for finding ways to really integrate technology into ways that we use the arts is really amazing. So that work is really helping to grow the field. Uh, we also are looking at a um, economic analysis to really understand what would the economic impact be if the arts were fully integrated in a health and well-being model. And, um, and as we begin to build that knowledge, that is being translated into the blueprint. Um, and also uh, our advisory board that you mentioned earlier are a group of thought leaders from all over the world that are really helping us craft and shape and think about this in ways that we haven't before. So I think this idea of a bold initiative that will take $100 million, that will take five to 10 years to build is really worth the investment when you think about the value that it can add to symptom relief, to quality of life, and to also thinking about this, as Emmeline said, this idea around how do you treat and work with the whole person and not the organ. Can you talk about the timeline a little bit more specifically? Mm -hmm. So in the short term, we will be launching the final blueprint next summer, early next summer. So between now and next summer, we will be finalizing the field overview. We're also doing a public opinion um, analysis, which is really fascinating to see what people are already thinking about this work. Um, and you know, to that end, um, I think the pandemic has actually heightened our understanding of why the arts are so important to us. I think we maybe unconsciously moved to them in other times, but the pandemic, pandemic has made us understand that we need to move to release stress. We need to, to, to share our voice. We need to use our hands to help us feel better. And so um, we'll, be, we'll be actually doing more in really bringing that work forward as well as part of the, 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 um, the public opinion work. Um, so all of those pieces of information will, will help to inform what will be launched um, early, early summer 2021. So Renee, I just, can I, I just pick up on that last point? Um, you know, uh, as Susan has suggested, we actually got together before COVID, before anybody heard of COVID, before there was a pandemic. There was already the sense that we were ready to put together a blueprint, which is Susan, and I want to underscore, the blueprint's just the beginning. It's the plan for how we make this happen. And it's going to take five to 10 years to, to turn it into reality. But I think COVID just really uh, clearly demonstrated for people across the world how fundamental the arts are to who we are as human beings. And so how are we going to take that and, and create a discipline that everybody can look to um, for research, for practice, um, 
for overall well-being. There are a couple other things I just want to mention about the plan. In general. Susan had mentioned that we're having stakeholder meetings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is an international uh, initiative. It's not just about what's happening in the United States. So um, we will be, um, among our other uh, stakeholder meetings, having at least one or two uh, with folks from other parts of the world. We're going to build on the international partners that the Aspen Institute has um, and bring them into play uh, and see how the rest of the world thinks about all this. So, um, uh, and we're, I, it, it's, it's a tremendous amount of work, but we're aiming to have this all done by, by next summer. Fabulous. Well, I'm so excited to be involved. And of course, some cultures are ahead of us in certain ways, but in this country, nothing gets done without data and nothing happens without the approval of science and especially the NIH. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Emmeline Edwards as uh, as the scientific advisor. So Dr. Edwards, um, we're going to have a presentation with you now so you can explain to us a little bit about integrative health. What is it? Uh, are we going to have the slides available? I suspect so, but I'm guessing we won't be able to see them on Zoom. Uh, okay. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So Chasen will follow you. Okay. All right. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, integrative health really is one of the three pillars of uh, what the, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health uh, focuses on in, in their mission. So uh, when, when I talk about integrative health, I am talking about a process by which uh, uh, integrative approaches are combined with uh, conventional medicine in a coordinated way. The whole purpose really is to have a uh, patient-centered approach that looks at multi-systems that uh, actually um, uh, treats the whole person, not an organ. And I can give you example where at NCCIH, which is the acronym for the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, where we actually have a lot of researchers that are currently uh, using integrative approaches for the management of pain, chronic pain, for also uh, helping uh, with symptom management for cancer survivors, and also to help uh, promote healthy behaviors. So this is a concept that I would like to give uh, the, the concept of whole person health, I'd like to give uh, you know, uh, credit to my current director, Dr. Elaine Langevin, who really has brought this concept forward and really is promoting the whole uh, process so that we do research that includes the fundamental science of interconnected system, uh, the, the increased use of uh, multimodal or multi-component interventions, and also um, utilize uh, uh, ways uh, to better understand how various systems are interacting with each other. So is there a difference between whole person health and integrative health? So I think um, essentially they are, um, you know, um, really uh, very similar in a way, except that whole personal health is a framework. It's a framework by which you help individuals improve their health um, by actually uh, taking into account multiple domains. So the psychological domain, the physical domain, and also um, the social uh, context. Yes, and spiritual, I think you have as well. And so it's yes. it's an, it's really extraordinary. Um, can you walk us through the acronym? So NIH, we know National Institutes of Health. What does the CC stand for? So uh, complementary is really a set of um, approaches that uh, originated uh, from uh, not from con from uh, the mainstream, but really that includes. Uh, component that uh, the primary input could be dietary, it could be psychological, it could be physical. I can give you some examples of each of those. So for the dietary, we've, we focus a lot on um, uh, botanical, uh, probiotics, special diets. For psychological, we have um, meditation, ac um, acupuncture, and of course, arts-based therapy and music. Um, in the physical, we also have um, dance and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tai Chi, Qigong. So, but the idea is to uh, study those systems in an interconnected way so that we can actually address uh, 
the whole the holistic aspect of uh, of an individual. So I'm guessing that even with a surgical or a pharmaceutical treatment, this integrative, these complementary uh, interventions will really help the patient improve. Absolutely, and at NCCIH, uh, it's never about um, you know. Uh, not using conventional medicine. It's really the idea of combining uh, conventional medicine with complementary approaches. So, uh, the, so at uh, maybe a few years back, our name actually included the, the, uh, the term alternative. And it really wasn't representative of what we actually have in our portfolio. Hence, Congress actually changed the name of the center to complementary and integrative health to better reflect uh, the philosophy and the uh, research program that we sponsored at uh, the NIH. So explain, just, just define intervention because uh, it's used with music therapists uh, in the intervention for the public. Tell us what that means. So when we talk about uh, intervention in, in a research study, we define that as the specific way the treatment approach is delivered uh, in the research setting. So for example, if we're talking about music, uh, in a study of, uh, you know, the impact of music on a health outcome, the intervention uh, may be working with a music therapist for maybe an hour, um, you know, uh, three times a week for about six months, and, uh, and, for, and then measuring a particular health outcome. Now, it's very important that uh, investigators uh, are very clear in, in defining their intervention, because let's say they they uh, have a study and the, the result happened to be positive. It's really important that others can replicate that so that um, they could actually uh, provide the benefit for other patients. So, and why is the NRA, NIH interested in music before looking at other art forms? So when you mentioned the, the uh, initiative called Sound Health at the NIH, and that started almost three years ago now, uh, when we started discussing the potential of looking at the arts uh, and the impact on health, we realized that uh, we have the most evidence in the context of music. So uh, a number of researchers were already looking at how music actually is uh, processed in the brain and the potential impact of music on some uh, neurological disorders. So for example, we know that um, you know, music has been used to improve the gait of Parkinson patient. Um, music has been used in studies of Alzheimer's disease to improve, uh, you know, uh, cognitive decline. So we, there was a basis, um, but all along we, we, want, we definitely wanted to expand. But for the time being, we are building a cohort of investigators that are looking more deeply into not only the mechanism of how music impacts the brain, but also how music therapy can be used for healing. So you have a vast research portfolio. So you're responsible really for deciding who gets the money in terms of research. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, one of the interesting things that you look at, which is placebo. It's something that we all know about, uh, but you're actually trying to find out what it is. So, when you do, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, start out by saying that we have uh, investigators that are currently investigating the role of placebo and perhaps even using placebo uh, as an intervention. But let me just explain what the placebo effect is. When you do a drug study um, and uh, the subject receive, like I said, the, the, the drug, but also uh, the experiment also includes a control. So uh, some, some uh, subject in the, in, the, in the study will receive a placebo pill, which means that the active ingredient of the drug is not included in the placebo, okay? Now, sometimes, uh, fairly frequently actually, people that are receiving the placebo are feeling better. And we wonder why is that? And we have an investigator at Harvard, Professor Ted Kapcha, is studying this. And in fact, if anybody has time, there is a, a video of uh, Dr. Um, Professor Katchup explaining this on the NCCIH website. But essentially, it has to do with the interaction of the subject and the provider, the health professional. So um, the empathy, the, the attention 
and also the trust that the patient puts into uh, the, the provider all contribute to this uh, you know, um, situation where the patient feels better, even though they might not be receiving the actual ingredient of the intervention. And the difference between, so if we're, if we're looking at hopefully uh, one, of, one of your slides which shows the actual brain, uh, what is the difference between the limbic and autonomic? Uh, auto autonomic. Autonomic circuitry. So um, when we talk about the limbic circuitry, we're talking about the limbic system, which is a system um, made up of structures that are, you know, subcortical structures. They are below the, the cortex. And uh, primary, uh, you know, uh, areas include the hippocampus, the amygdala, uh, the hypothalamus, the, um, you know, I'll call it the basal ganglia. And those areas actually are involved in uh, emotion and also um, memory. So, and interestingly enough, the limbic system actually also controls some aspect of the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is um, actually composed of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic uh, system. And uh, these two systems actually control uh, really how the brain is interacting with uh, the internal organ. So all of, again, this is uh, a good framework for understanding how uh, what's going on in your brain and what's going on in your body are interconnected. And that gives uh, even more credence to the fact that we really want to study those uh, interconnected systems. Well, that makes perfect sense. Uh, one of my daughters has just started med school, so I'm getting the education also here. I want to go back to school now. <laughs> so uh, one last question. So regarding COVID-19, we've seen this amazing outpouring of artistry from citizens around the world. Uh, what's the research on the potential impact of art-based therapies and mental health? So there's been a, an incredible flurry of activity at the NIH, uh, not only uh, in the context of developing a vaccine and developing uh, you know, other th uh, therapeutics for, for COVID, but also in the context of uh, how to deal with the long-term um, you know, sequelae of uh, COVID-19 and how to deal with uh, the stress aspect of uh, dealing with uh, this pandemic. So um, NCCIH, along with all the other institutes, all the other 27 institutes at the NIH, have really provided a series of funding opportunities and investigators are uh, um, taking advantage of this, um, you know, uh, looking at the impact of, uh, you know, stress, looking at the, um, you know, impact of, um, you know, not, uh, you know, uh, access to care and, and a number of uh, areas of interest. So this has been an incredible amount of activity that, uh, you know, uh, will definitely, uh, you know, pay dividends. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Edwards. Of Susan and Ruth, our advisory board is extraordinary with powerful voices such as architect Liz Diller, pop icon Macy Gray, co-founder of BET Sheila Johnson, and our previous Music and Mind Live guests, David Leventhal, Daniel Levitin, and Drs. Charles Lim and Vivek Murthy. And I've seen increased interest in the intersection. So why now? Susan, you want to jump in? That we're seeing um, in some ways a perfect storm. Um, as Ruth said, before COVID-19, we knew that the technology and the, the science was getting better and better. And we were seeing, as Emily pointed out, um, a lot of knowledge around things like the autonomic nervous system, around sensory systems and mechanisms, around how different types of arts worked at a mechanistic level. Um, music certainly is, is the most studied, but there are also visual arts and literary arts. Um, there's quite a bit of research that's happened around the built environment and architecture. Um, we know dance and movement have, have um, been studied quite um, significantly over the last several years. And media arts um, is also being studied um, at a deeper level and things like um, thinking about virtual reality programs that can help address pain or looking at different ways to help children with autism using different kinds of media arts. So there has been this growing wave of interest and also knowledge that we've been gaining. We also have seen in every part of the, of the planet at a very local level, the arts being used to solve um, 
uh, health issues, prevention issues, natural disasters, refugee problems. And now we have COVID, where we see COVID really being the kind of thing that requires this access and affordability and immediacy to help us deal with stress and anxiety. Um, and also, I would say PTSD is um, among healthcare workers and first responders is epi at an epidemic proportion. So we're seeing this natural evolutionary trait as humans be something that we are really accessing in ways that we've never done before. And then I guess I'd like to add too, um, is that the things that have been happening in the United States around social justice and health inequities, um, in part being the light being shown from COVID in terms of health inequities, is also helping us really understand community and community development and connective tissue and how by thinking about some of these arts and culture um, opportunities, we can actually um, build a more just um, society. So I think the timing is, it couldn't be better um, and, and I think we also have the ability now to talk to each other in ways that we hadn't in such a busy time. So I think the doubling down has actually been very helpful for this as well. And Ruth, I'll send it over to you. Uh, Susan I, I, or Renee, um, I, I, Susan is the scientist here. I, I, I'm gonna give a less scientific answer, uh, but that I suspect um, is what we all feel. At a time, this pandemic, um, has created uh, for so many people a sense of isolation, a sense of loneliness. Um, in some ways, we're more siloed than we had been before. Music and the arts of all sorts throughout human history has been something that has brought people together like nothing else, like nothing else. And I think at this incredibly um, challenging time for everybody, this has been something that has been able to bring people together because we just know it intuitively. The science is there, but people have just leapt at the opportunity to come together through the arts. And um, virtually every night of the news, you, you, you see some wonderful story, whether it's people singing in Italy off the balconies or um, kids with their parents. Um, it's just been remarkable to see. And, and we're just lucky that this has provided even greater impetus for us to take this work and move it forward. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm gonna switch to some questions now because we're running so late. Uh, uh, Trevor wants to know how receptive to integrative medicine the conventional medical establish and establishment is and if there's resistance founded on financial interests. That's a good question. I would say that um, there's lot, there is work to be done, but increasingly uh, integrative approaches are, are being combined with conventional medicine. Um, so a, a very good example uh, is in the VA system, the Veterans Administration, where they actually have a full program on whole, per, uh, you know, whole person, uh, you know, a centered approach. So um, the idea is um, it's actually taking roots and, um, you know, increasingly uh, we are seeing more acceptance. Great. Um, uh, Rosalva asks, my mom has had chronic pain for over 30 years. What is the progress in pain management as part of integrative holistic care? I'd love to see pain treatment have new outlooks. So again, in the context of uh, chronic pain, we now understand that it's not only uh, a, uh, a physiological uh, system, uh, a problem, that it's a biopsychosocial approach that's uh, the most promising meaning that uh, one needs to understand the experience of pain and at the same time treat the actual uh, physical uh, you know, uh, condition. So the idea of uh, using uh, complementary approaches to help uh, you know, uh, better acceptance of the situation along with conventional treatment has uh, shown great promise. So we have uh, lots of studies that are looking at uh, acupuncture for back pain. Um, meditation uh, also is very helpful. So there is a whole uh, you know, a set of um, combined treatment that are offering patients a number of options. Um, last question from Carrie, who's interested in the inclusion of spirituality and whole person integrative models. And I saw that actually in your slide. Do any programs uh, allow a place for spiritual practice? Uh, definitely, uh, we actually are interested in uh, having ways to 
to uh, scientifically study those concepts. So uh, if uh, any, uh, a researcher is interested in that kind of uh, you know, research, they will need to actually demonstrate to us that it's actually feasible, that there are methods to study it, and that uh, they, uh, they are able to actually have uh, uh, um, a study design that's appropriate. So um, we, we certainly are open, um, but we have to remain within the whole concept of scientific rigor and, uh, uh, and, and you know, uh, encourage uh, good science to be done. So I'd like to suggest to the audience to look at the press release for the NeuroArts Blueprint, which we'll share, and stay tuned. There's a website called neuroartsblueprint.org, and you can sign up on the main page to receive updates. I certainly will. Many thanks to our extraordinary guests, Susan Meg Salmon, Ruth Katz, and Dr. Emmeline Edwards. Um, we'll come back to you, Emmeline, because you're going to introduce a film at the very end. So we look forward to seeing you all again next week. For a reminder, do sign up for the newsletter at my Facebook page or my website, ReneeFleming.com, and I encourage you to review past episodes of Music and Mind Live on my Facebook page, Renee Fleming Music, in the meantime. Next week should be especially fun. We'll be taking a look at music therapy and video games. Yes, you heard that. Our topic will be Mind Games, New Tech for Music and Health. I'll be wel welcoming three brilliant polymath guests, each one a scientific inventor, creative artist in his or own, her own right. Dr. Adam Ghazali, professor of neurology, physiology, and psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, and founder of Neuroscape, a center devoted to research and the creation of new technology, will discuss his work using therapeutic video games for ADHD and other conditions. Musical visionary and friend, composer Todd Macover, professor of music and media at the MIT Media Lab, where he also directs the Opera of the Future group. We'll talk about his composition, Stretching the Boundaries of Music Technology. And we'll be joined by Dr. Grace Leslie, who directs the Brain Music Lab at Georgia Tech's Center for Music Te Technology. A flutist and electronic musician, she creates brain music tech that reveals the internal states of a performer's brain to an audience. It's going to be a fascinating episode, so please join us on September 22nd at 5 p.m. Eastern. So we'll leave you with one more video. Dr. Edwards will introduce it. It gives me hope for the future of this project and our reconnection to our creative selves. Thank Emily. you. So this video is really a three-minute video that talks about um, arts prescribing. So this is the hope for us. Once we have uh, the Neuro Art Blueprints uh, launch, we are hoping that at some point in the US, uh, physician will be willing and able to prescribe, uh, you know, participation in the arts as part of the treatment plan. This is already happening in the UK and the video is actually gonna feature Dr. Daisy Fancourt uh, talking about uh, the process by which they've done that in the UK. So I wanna thank you everybody for their attention. It's been a pleasure uh, joining this conversation. Thank you all. Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful announcement. Very exciting. My name is Dr. Daisy Fancourt, and in my humble opinion, the arts should be available on prescription to everyone in the UK. Currently, about 20% of GP visits are made not for medical, but for social reasons. For example, unemployment, low-level mental health conditions, low-level chronic pain. And there are two problems with this. First of all, people rarely get support that actually tackles the problem that they have. And this means that they can actually not feel like their problem has been solved or their needs have been heard. And the other problem with this is that it's a big cost for the NHS. In fact, the cost is thought to be the equivalent of the salaries of 3,750 GPs each year. So as a result of this, across the country over the last few years, we've been trialing a scheme called Arts on Prescription. Now this works just like a normal prescription service in that GPs can fill out a simple paper form, but instead of taking this to a pharmacy to get medication, people can take this to someone called a link worker. The link worker's role is to know all about existing activities that are available in people's communities. So these can range from community choirs, book clubs, drama groups, gardening associations, and we've got a huge number of these resources available. So the link worker works with the patient to co-create a prescription 
And this is a much longer consultation than we normally have the luxury of having in a GP practice. It could even be as long as an hour talking through what someone's actual needs are, not treating the condition, but treating them as a person, as a whole being. So let's have an example of someone who's gone through this. There's a woman called Debs who I spoke to recently who told a very powerful story and said I could share it. Debs had had mental health condition for a very long time and for many years had been unable to work and on medication and benefits. And she had a crisis point about seven years ago when she was in hospital at her worst, her lowest moment. But then her psychologist referred her onto an arts programme in the community and she said that was an absolute turning point in her life. She went along to the first class a little reluctantly because she didn't feel she was particularly artistic as a person. But she said as her painting improved, her mental health started to improve too. So now, Debs has been off medication for six years. This is someone who was taking 21 tablets a day prior to that. She's no longer on benefits. Instead, she now works for the NHS Trust that used to teach her. But she's also a really active member of her local community. But what this really shows is this can have a very tangible impact on someone's life. NHS England has now taken this on as a scheme and across 2018 and beyond they're looking to roll this out across the country. We're hoping that 42,000 GPs will be able to take part in arts and prescription by the end. But it's also a way of thinking more carefully about how healthcare is delivered. This is a joined up approach between health, between community, voluntary sector and the arts sector. But also it's something that places the person in the middle, really empowers them and gives them the opportunity to do things that don't just treat their symptoms, but actually enable them to move forward with more fulfilling, meaningful lives.